Hey guys, this is Mr. Kennedy back with Mendelian Genetics, and I'm using a Prezi that I got offline. It is uh, allowed for educational use, so everything's okay. Uh, when we talk about Mendelian Genetics, we have to focus in on two big questions. You know, how are traits inherited, and how are the traits that are inherited expressed? So hopefully we'll get an answer to those two things throughout the Prezi. Now, you can't talk about Mendelian Genetics without talking about a man named Gregory Mendel. Gregory Mendel was a monk. He lived in the mid-1800s, and he was in charge of the monastery garden, and he loved to grow peas. Now, when you think back to the 1800s, how they think things were inherited, they thought of a blending process. For example, if you were orange and you married someone who was white, you would have a blending of the characteristics. It made sense. A tall person and a short person would make a medium person. Um, we know that's not totally true, so... That begs the question, what is true? All right. So what happened? Gregor Mendel, because he did use the monastery garden and he grew peas, he took peas as the plant that he studied. Now, it ended up being the perfect plant because it was easy to grow and maintain, easy to control the mating. He could control what, which one pollinated which. Lots of babies fairly quickly. He could get rid of the babies fairly easily. Uh, quick generation time, you know, and... Fairly easy, or only a few traits, so it worked out pretty well for Mendel. Um, you know, the traits that he started out was either a round or wrinkled, or, or purple or white, or short, short or tall, so it was pretty easy. Well, in Mendel's experiment, he had to have a couple of things. He had to have a true breed. True breed means it's a pure breed, uh, means that it will be, e, be what we call homozygous. Homo means the same. All right, if you remember from regular biology, and hetero means different. Homozygous means that it's going to be pure. It's going to only have the purple trait, or only have the white trait, or only have the short trait, or tall. And then he would cross these lines of pure. So he would cross a line that only gave him purple with a line that only gave him white, and he would see what happened. Now, if the blending was true, then he'd have get a lighter purple, but that's not what happened. What happened was that all the plants ended up being purple, so that kind of led him into his discovery of what in the world was going on. Now, in Mendel's experiment, there's a couple things we need to know. He called the generation that he started with the true breach, he called it the P generation, or for parent generation. He called the offspring of that generation the F1 generation, or filial generation. Let me write that for you. That's... Uh, filial generation, or means children, so it's the first generation, and they called the children of the children the F2 generation. So if you think about this, the P generation would be your grandparents, the F1 generation would be your mom and dad, and the F2 generation would be you. All right. Now, what he ended up doing when he crossed the purple and the white, he noticed that all the F1 generation were all purple, so the white generation, or the white characteristic, disappeared. And when he crossed the F1 generation of all these purple, he ended up with about 75% being purple and only about 25% being white. So it was this three to one ratio. So that kind of got him to thinking, you know, what exactly was going on here? Now, he did this with all sorts of characteristics and he always came out with very similar results, three to one. So... He was wondering, you know, there must be something linked to this, why it's doing this. Now, there is a reason why it didn't come out exactly three to one, because it was totally by random, right? Totally by random. But anyway, Mendel drew two conclusions. There must be two alleles that code for a trait, and these alleles are different forms of a trait, and you get one allele from your mom and one allele from your dad. Now, he also deducted that these alleles must be found on chromosomes, okay, and such as here. You got the purple locus and the white locus, and for some reason, this purple dominates the white. So dominant means that's the one that's going to be expressed. Recessive would be the one that is not expressed. So if you look here, in this case, he did big P, big P as a homozygous purebred purple, and he crossed it with a little P, little P white, which is homozygous purebred white, and got all purples, but they each have one dominant trait and one recessive trait so the dominant one showed up that's why all the f1 were purple then when he crossed those he ended up with getting three out of four every four plants would be purple and one out of four would be white but realize they would have different alleles okay 
Now, so if you look, if you look at genotype and phenotype, now I hope you remember that. Phenotype is its physical appearance, right? This is what it looks like. Physical appearance. That's what it looks like. The genotype is its genetic makeup. So gene, gene, phenotype, phenotype. So purple, 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 and white would be its phenotype. Big P, big P would be a genotype. Big P, little P would be a genotype. And little P, little P would be a genotype. So even though there was three out of four were purple, that would be the phenotypic ratio. The genotypic ratio was actually a one to one ratio. Now, if we restate this, we're now aware there are some exceptions to the rule. We have incomplete dominance, co-dominance, uh, multiple alleles, things like that. We'll talk about later on. Okay? But now in simple dominance, this is holding true. Now, Mendel basically had two laws. He had the law of segregation which said that only one allele for a trait goes into a gamete, and it's totally by chance which one goes there. All right? And because it's a random process, this explains why you have all the different variations. And it occurs during metaphase and anaphase of meiosis to produce the gamete. So it depends on how they line up at the plate. depends on what you get. Okay? Now, and we talked about that in the last chapter. The law of independent assortment says that separate alleles for separate traits are passed independently of each other. That means that the allele for eye color is not necessarily attached to the allele for hair color. Or in Mendel's case, um, the color of the pod, yellow or green, is not related to the shape of the pod, either smooth or wrinkled. So that, that is, they totally are independent of one another, which gives you more variation, right? Now, excuse me. Now, this can all be explained if you look at meiosis and you understand how it works, right? Uh, if you understand how it works, you know that it's totally by random how it all ends up coming to pass. All right, now, whenever you get independent assortment, it can lead to a different traits of their parents actually showing up. So even though the offspring is a result of both mom and dad's traits, 50-50 uh, blend, it recombination might be different than what actually the parent is, right? For example, uh, if you looked over here on the side, I moved away from it, let's go back. If you look over here on the side, if you have a yellow smooth and a green wrinkled parent, you could have a recombinant offspring that actually is yellow and wrinkled or smooth and green, so it can be totally opposite of the parent, but it still it comes from the parent itself. Now, so this is basically the death of the blending hypothesis. Mendel's work showed that parent traits are not blended in the offspring. You know, for example, mom and dad can create a person here that does not have uh, all the characteristics of either one of them, and it might have characteristics that none of them share, like he's taller than both parents, uh, different hair color than both parents. He's losing his hair. His dad has hair, uh, which we know it comes from the mom's side of the family anyway. But anyway, that shows you that it's not necessarily a blending of traits. Now, realize we can take this a step further and we can go into things called Punnett squares. Now, when we do monohybrid crosses, remember mono means one trait. Uh, so a monohybrid cross is a trait of one, crossing one trait like green or, excuse me, color or height or texture. And what you notice is that when you do this, you get all the possible combinations that may be there, such as you can determine uh, what the dad gives, what the mom gives, and all the possible offspring that can occur. And we're going to work out some problems like this. You can also have a dihybrid cross. This is when you look at two traits. So if you have two traits, the pop possibilities increase. Remember, monohybrid, you only have four different kinds of people or offspring. Dihybrid cross, you can have 16 different possibilities or genotypes. So it even increases what the chances are. Now, Mendel, now, now we also do now in, in genetics, we do what's called a test cross. Let's say we have an organism that displays the dominant characteristic, but we don't know if they're heterozygous or homozygous. The way we can figure out exactly what it is, we would cross that with the homozygous recessive individual, and we'd be able to tell. So if you look, I'm sorry, if you look over here, then if you have a parent that was 
big P, big P, all the offspring should be purple because they have to always get a big P. But if you have a parent that is big P, little P, and still purple, then half the offspring be white and half the offspring be purple. So we can actually determine through this test cross what the genotype of the parent is. All right, I hope that gave you a brief overview of Mendelian genetics, and I will talk to you soon.